Hi, I'm Ron Witten, the Architecture Editor Emeritus of Golf Digest Magazine, with another deep look at a single golf hole, this time the 17th hole at TPC Sawgrass Players Stadium Course, the infamous Island Green Par 3, the epitome of target golf, the most recognizable, the most photographed, and perhaps the most frightening hole in the game. We all know this hole, even if we've never seen it in person. Pete Dye was hired to design a course to test the best PGA Tour players in the world each year at the Players' Championship. He felt the best way to do that was to mess with their heads. This is a hole, he said, that gets into every player's mind from the very first tee. It nags them for four hours or more. They know it's coming. They have to face it. It really is the simplest of golf holes. Just a couple of tees, a green 26 yards deep, 30 yards wide, and a lake almost all the way around it. The longest it plays is 137 yards. Before the 2001 Players' Championship, Golf Digest asked three golfers to hit 50 shots each at the 17th, hitting in rotation. Tour pro Mark McCumber, the 1988 Players' Champion, hit 42 under the putting surface, seven into the fringe, and one in the water. Four handicap golf writer John Hawkins hit 38 onto the green, two in the fringe, two in a bunker, and eight in the water. 16 handicap Tony Baselli, Jacksonville Jaguars offensive tackle, hit 25 on the green, 20 in the water, five on the collar, and one in the bunker. The three agreed it wasn't that hard a shot. As the title suggests, it was mind over water. Technically, it's not an island green at all. It's a peninsula with a very narrow footpath isthmus. The isthmus is important, not just for providing golfers and mowers access to and from the green. It also contains irrigation and drainage pipes that run under the green, beneath the walkway, and onto the mainland. Here's the original plan of TPC Sawgrass, which in those days was called Tournament Players Club at Inlet Beach. The site was a swamp. So the first thing that was done was to drain the swamp by digging a moat around the perimeter of the proposed course. That left a lot of muck, so Pete's associate David Postawaite, who was construction supervisor on the project, started digging through the muck to see if he could hit some solid ground. What he found was several veins of pure white sugar sand. So as Pete later put it, they flipped the entire property. Dug away the muck, put it aside, dug out the sand, put it aside, then filled the holes with the muck and put the sand on top. If you look closely at the original plan, you'll notice the 17th was a conventional par three with a small pond on its right. There's no detail as to the bunkering or other features, but I'm sure Pete was envisioning something along the lines of the 17th hole at Harbortown, where the water is not really in play. But the more they dug, the deeper and wider the cavity became in the area. Dean Beeman, the PGA Tour Commissioner and Pete's boss on the project, wanted big high spectator mounds lining the last three holes, so most of the muck dug out was piled up to create those mounds. There wasn't any way to fill the hole back in. Given the mounds, Pete couldn't fit a hole in facing north, but he wanted it to face north so that he'd have all four par threes playing in four different directions. His wife Alice said, just keep the green where it was and make it an island. And that's what he did. They framed it not with railroad ties, but with cypress planks and then filled it in with some of that sugar sand. The green was a simple shape. Pete called it apple shaped. Others would later declare it to be a frying pan over the fire. He added one pot bunker to the front right, also a simple shape. Pete normally designed in the field, drawing rudimentary diagrams in the sand using a stick. But Beeman's bankers wanted real plans, so a complete set of hole-by-hole -hole diagrams were drawn up. Nobody seems to remember who drew them. In the late 1980s, Mike Hurdson received the plan of the 17th from Beeman who at the time was touring with the idea of having a nationwide network of TPC brand driving ranges, each with a replica of the Island 17th Green in the middle of the range. Nothing ever came of the idea, but Mike kept the plan and later had Pete verify its authenticity by signing it. If you look closely at the plan, the main change from what was built is a second walkway to the green. Now it could be that at the time they were considering wooden walk bridges to and from the green rather than the actual isthmus that was built. And from the circles around the green, it appears the plan at that time was to use something big and solid like vertical telephone poles to ring the green. 
something Pete had used as bulkheads on other projects. With either change, it would have looked much different. During final shaping, Pete didn't think the hole would be all that hard for pros, so he canted the green towards the back. Alice took one look at it and said, I can see the telecast now. The announcer comes on. Ladies and gentlemen, the first threesome is still on the 17th tee. Nobody has been able to stay on the green. We may not finish this tournament. So he raised the back of the green. You can see that here, how the isthmus is lower than the back of the green. This was the completed hole in 1981, a year before it opened. Notice the huge spectator mounds, like stadium seats. The one on the left of this picture was to provide views of the 16th green and the entire 17th hole. The far mound on the right was curved around to provide views of both the 17th and the par 4 18th. You can see the volume of material that was removed in order to create these huge gallery mounds. By the late 1980s, the 16th green had been relocated closer to the water, but the big spectator mound was removed in order to make room for money-making skyboxes. The grassy stadium seats along 17 still existed though, but by the early 2000s, they too had been removed. In its place was a gradual slope on which people could still sit and watch play, and behind them wide flat spots to house more skyboxes. When I last played the course in 2019, I arrived at the 17th tee and saw two things. First, I thought the entire green had sunk several feet. Turns out the lake water level was just higher than normal. But I also noticed a railing around the back of the green. Oh my gosh, I thought, somebody must have fallen off the back of the green and lawyers made them put up a railing. That will ruin the hole. But it was nothing that drastic. The maintenance crew had just rebuilt the isthmus and resodded the entire thing, so they built a temporary walkway to keep golfers off the tender turf. In his autobiography, Bury Me in a Pot Bunker, Pete Dye insisted he only designed two island greens in his entire career. This one and the 17th at PGA West Stadium course, built in 1986 and patterned suspiciously after the TPC one, except for rocks instead of a wooden bulkhead. The earliest documented island greens we're at Atlanta Athletic Club, now East Lake, in 1908, which still exists, and at Baldusrol in New Jersey, which doesn't. A.W. Tillinghast took it out when he remodeled Baldusrol in 1922. But Tilly did do an early one at Galen Hall in Philadelphia in 1917, and it's still in play, just as rustic as ever. Herbert Strong did one in 1932 at Ponte Vedra Club, and it still exists just a mile or so up the road from TPC Sawgrass. Robert Trent Jones did one at the Golden Horseshoe in Virginia. Not to be outdone, Desmond Muirhead did one in 1970 on a par five. The 18th at Mission Hills in Rancho Mirage, California, which was the site of the LPGA's Dinah Shore event for decades. There have been novelty island greens as well. Robert Bruce Harris did a dual island greens on the par three 13th at Finkbein Golf Course at the University of Iowa. And John Steidel, did a genuine apple-shaped green at Apple Tree Golf Club in Yakima, Washington. The most famous novelty island green is the 14th at Coeur d'Alene Resort in Idaho, where Scott Miller created a floating island green that sits offshore in Lake Coeur d'Alene. I had the privilege of exploring this one when it was built in 1990, and it's like an iceberg. More of it is submerged, a big honeycomb of concrete and styrofoam and chambers holding irrigation and drain pipe than is visible. And it's a true island. You need a boat to get to and from it. What all these island greens have in common is unlike the 17th of TPC Sawgrass, they have some margin for error, enough room for bunkers and even trees. There have been any number of heroics in the history of the 17th hole. In practice rounds, Jerry Pate dunked four balls in the water, but birdied it three out of four days when he won the 1982 Players' Championship the first held at TPC Sawgrass. Playing an orange ball, if you recall. That's the players' tournament where Pate tossed Beeman and Die into the lake beside the 18th green, then dove in himself. When he won in 2015, Ricky Fowler birdied the hole three times in a single day. First early Sunday morning on a wrap-up of the third round, then that afternoon in the final round, and once more for the win in a playoff over who else? Sergio Garcia. Then there's Tiger's heroics. At the Saturday round of the 2001 Players' Championship, Tiger hit 9-iron long, almost went in the water behind. 
He was 60 yards from the hole, facing a downhill double-breaking putt. Johnny Miller asked Gary Koch in the tower at 17 if he thought Tiger got the right line. Better than most, Gary said, better than most. The ball stopped at a ridge, then went down the slope, broke right, and into the hole. Tiger won by one the next day. But I more clearly remember Tiger in the 1994 U.S. Amateur. Six down to trip Keeney with 17 to play, he rallied and pulled all square by the 17th tee. Tiger hit first, right at the flag on the back right, but almost flew the green, bouncing backwards off the fringe and ending on the collar. From there, he rolled in his 15-footer and did his now classic fist pump, maybe the first aired around the world. That gave him a one-up lead, and when he halved 18, Tiger won the first of three straight U.S. amateurs. One year, when the club did 40,000 daily fee rounds, the maintenance crew retrieved 120,000 golf balls from the water around the 17th green. That's an average of three balls per golfer. What's that tell us? That most of us, when we hit into the drink on 17, don't head to the drop area for our next shot, where it's only 92 yards and faces into an upward slope of the green. No, we insist on staying on the tee. We want to hit that green. We don't want the hole to win. We don't want Pete Dye to win, but he does time and time again. That's what makes it a great hole.